1970. In my principal work, The Philosophy of Consciousness Without an Object, the main object is to try to establish the possibility of a metaphysical knowledge in such a way as to satisfy our present philosophical and epistemological and psychological criticism. The emphasis here is upon knowledge. Naturally, we must have some basis of knowing before we can be sure of the course of possibility. But the end or the purpose of realization is not completely summed up in a metaphysical kind of knowing. That is only one third of the whole, though it has been in my own experience the aspect of chief interest, as it was with Shankara of old. As was pointed out in the record of the realization which took place on the 7th of August, 1936, and the second realization of a major sort, which occurred on the 9th of September, 1936. While in the record of this, it was shown that there were effects both in the domain of power and of delight. These aspects have not been largely developed in what I have written and said. So it has seemed appropriate to give some attention to these two aspects. Fundamental yoga consists of three aspects known as the tri marga. They are technically karma yoga, bhakti yoga, and jnana yoga. The line of emphasis in my own experience was the Jnana Yoga. But it is true to my experience to say that out of this came more than knowledge. There was a sense of the most profound delight and of a sense of a profound but subtle power. It would seem, therefore, that to have traveled the way of one of these yogas is to realize the benefit in some measure of the other two. Aurobindo in his writings confirms this, but he also makes the observation that on each of the lines of the tri marja there is a special emphasis or aspect that is developed. 
which is something more than the partial realization of the two other forms of yoga when one has developed primarily over one of them and that therefore all three paths should be traveled if possible at the same time and this would be a kind of synthesis of yoga or if that is not practical then successively so that all the possibilities of the three may be realized. There are certain observations made in an essay by Sri Aurobindo on the subject of Heraclitus and his insight. And there is a portion at the end that is worth our serious attention for it bears upon a problem that is peculiar to the West. Aurobindo says at the end as follows, quoting, speaking of Heraclitus, but there is one great gap and defect, whether in his knowledge of things or his knowledge of the self of man. We see in how many directions the deep divining eye of Heraclitus anticipated the largest and profoundest generalizations of science and philosophy, and how even his most superficial thoughts indicate later powerful tendencies of the Occidental mind, and how, too, some of his ideas influence such profound and fruitful thinkers as Plato, the Stoics, the Neoplatonists. But in his defect also he is a forerunner. It illustrates the great deficiency of later European thought, such of it at least as has not been profoundly influenced by Asiatic religion or Asiatic mysticism. I have tried to show how often his thought touches and is almost identical with the Vedic and Vedantic. But his knowledge of the truth of things stopped with the vision of the universal reason and the universal force. He seems to have summed up the principle of things in these two first terms, the aspect of consciousness, the aspect of power, a supreme intelligence and a supreme energy. The eye of the Indian thought saw a third aspect of the self and of Brahman. Besides the universal consciousness acted in divine knowledge, beside the universal force acted in divine will, it saw the universal delight acted in divine love and joy. European thought, following the line of Heraclitus thinking, has fixed itself on reason and on force, and made them the principle towards whose perfection our being has to aspire. Force is the first aspect of the world. War, the clash of energies. The second aspect, reason, emerges out of the appearance of force in which it is at first hidden and reveals itself as a certain justice, a certain harmony, a certain determining intelligence and reason in things.
The third aspect is a deeper secret behind these two. Universal delight, love, beauty, which taking up the other two can establish something higher than justice, better than harmony, truer than reason. Unity and bliss, the ecstasy of our fulfilled existence. Of this last secret power, Western thought has only seen two lower aspects, pleasure and aesthetic beauty. It has missed the spiritual beauty and the spiritual delight. For that reason, Europe has never been able to develop a powerful religion of its own. It has been obliged to turn to Asia. Science takes possession of the measures and utilities of force. Rational philosophy pursues reason to its last subtlety. But inspired philosophy and religion can seize hold of the highest secret, Uttamam Rahasyam. Heraclitus might have seen it if he had carried his vision a little further. Force by itself can only produce a balance of forces, the strife that is justice. In that strife there takes place a constant exchange and once this need of exchange is seen, there arises the possibility of modifying and replacing law by reason as the determinant principle of the exchange. This is the second effort of man, of which Heraclitus did not clearly see the possibility. From exchange we can rise to the highest possible idea of exchange, a mutual dependency of self-giving as the hidden secret of life. From that can grow the power of love, replacing strife and exceeding the cold balance of reason. There is the gate of the divine ecstasy. Heraclitus could not see it, and yet his one saying about the kingdom of the child touches, almost reaches, the heart of the secret. For this kingdom is evidently spiritual. It is the crown, the mastery to which the perfected man arrives, and the perfect man is a divine child. He is the soul which awakens to the divine plane, accepts it without fear or reserve, gives itself up in a spiritual purity to the divine, allows the careful and troubled force of man to be freed from care and grief, and become the joyous play of the divine will, his relative and stumbling reason to be replaced by the divine knowledge which to the Greek, the rational man, is foolishness, and the laborious pleasure-seeking of the bound mentality to lose itself in the spontaneity of the divine Ananda. For of such is the kingdom of heaven, the Paramhamsa, the liberated man, is in his soul, Balabat, even as if a child. End of the quotation. In this critique of Sri, Sri Aurobindo, I think I must agree, for I do not find this third aspect 
recognized with real seriousness in our Western philosophies. To be sure, we have the conception of the hedonic tone, the degree to which a state of consciousness may be colored or toned, either by happiness or suffering. But this is not generally taken in the profound sense of Ananda as known in yoga. Also, I am impressed with the fact that in the history of Christianity there is a rather grim and somber quality. <clears throat> Solemnity is a note that appears there but it is more or less a grim solemnity. Very often, particularly in the early days of Christianity, the imitatio Christi was interpreted as an acceptance of suffering and it is said that it was even viewed by those early dedicated Christians that it was necessary to finish life painfully and violently as was true of the Christ. <clears throat> Our own history is connected with the Puritan movement, which in its term denounce the lighter, more joyous things of life, denied to religiosity all of the coloring that came from art and from music, and imposed a rather grim austere and austere life upon the parishioners. <clears throat> now I know from my experience of the realizations that there is a quality of delight in their state of consciousness which actually is beyond imagining. But let us outline somewhat of what the three parts of the Trimaja are. Let us start with Karma Yoga. This Karma means action. But action involves the exercise of the will. So we can call this as manifesting through three aspects or so, such as the will, the principle of power, and the principle of effectuation. <coughs> Taking next the Janana Yoga, in its turn it manifests through the principle of knowledge, of judgment, and discernment. The key note here is the determination of truth. But our third form, known as Bhakti Yoga, covers the neglected side, namely that 
which we may call variously eros, esthesis, <coughs> the aspect of love, of delight, of beauty, of sweetness. <clears throat> the quality perhaps mm, requiring most emphasis in this yoga in this yoga is the quality which we generally represent by love there are certain terms that suggest this particular aspect or mode of our consciousness such as benevolence compassion pity brotherly feeling good will none of them are quite adequate to express the quality in the yogic realization that carries this delight. Or our association of meaning with these terms tends to be mundane or perhaps sociological. Even restricted to a purely vital meaning. Thus, when one speaks of love, ordinarily, he has in mind the vital aspect of love, an aspect that is as much a matter of self-seeking as of self-giving. It often is very closely connected with its opposite, namely hate, so that its expression here is often a matter of love, hate, a passionate turmoil, very often, and often too, he who functions in this way does not want too much of the quality of gentleness, too much of the quality of peace, but actually craves combat preceding a period of peaceful reckoning reconciliation the adjustment of life is therefore something like a fight and love and so forth this is love at a low level not much above that of the animal it has its admirable aspects, its capacity for self-sacrifice and dedication to the object, even the capacity to give up life itself for the beloved in some cases. But it is also selfish, seeking the good only in the narrow of the narrow circle of the beloved and oneself and then beyond to one's family the word is so loaded with this meaning that it actually is not a good term for expressing what is true of the love of the divine or of the divine love 
Benevolence also is inadequate because it suggested, it suggests something of a bestowal upon those who occupy a lesser position from that as contrasted to that of the benevolent one. It is doing well and kindly toward those who have need and is, of course, a very worthy attitude. It may reach definitely above a purely vital level and may have something of the mental in it and perhaps a touch of the spiritual. But this, too, falls far short of the love of the divine or the divine love. Compassion, too, while a very noble attitude and involving a meaning akin to benevolence, nonetheless especially indicates a relationship of the superior who is not in need towards an inferior who has needs and therefore requires help. In our use of the term, it is akin to pity. But there is another meaning as explained in a footnote of the Voice of the Silence, which involves much more. Actually, the word in our dictionary use of it is not correct for this meaning, but evidently there is no other word available that will serve better. It means the maintaining of the balance in the operation of the world and the forces that uh, uh, move among men so that the harmony in things may be maintained. In this sense, the compassionate one is the maintainer of the equilibrium, the balance, the harmony, harmony, the symmetry of the universe and of all life. And because suffering of creatures tends to destroy this harmony, it follows that the compassionate one seeks to heal the suffering so that the harmony may be maintained. It is in this sense that we speak of the Buddha of compassion. <clears throat> the, con the concept of brotherhood carries part of the meaning. Brotherhood rises above the particular vitalistic meanings that have been so largely associated with our conception of love, which is oriented most particularly to the relationship between the sexes and the parent's relationship to his offspring and of the offspring to their parents. But again, a brotherhood can be conceived and generally is conceived as a purely horizontal relationship of man to man, of race to race, of class to class and does not of itself imply a transcendental relationship 
between the lover of God and the God love to this lover, which is something very different indeed. Yet, since our terminology is inadequate, and the word has yet not yet been produced to suggest the true meaning, we'll have to do the best we can. And so, we'll speak of the yoga of love. The yoga of love, or bhakti yoga differs from the other two forms of the tri marja in that essentially there is no discipline in this yoga. The yoga of action or karma yoga has as its governing principle the renunciation of all fruits of action to act without concern for the fruits and ultimately at a more advanced stage we even renounce the actions themselves Janana Yoga involves the fundamental discipline of renouncing all predilection, all preconception of the truth, all preferred ideas. There are other subsidiary disciplines that may aid with respect to these yogas. Some use very difficult body discipline, the breath, for example. So <clears throat> there may be meditation at prescribed times, but all of this is simply in the form of age. One may not have the attitude of renouncing the fruits of his actions. He may be strongly colored as the candidate with the desire for those fruits, even viewing the fruits as the reason for the action. But by a discipline in which he simulates as best he can, an attitude of acting without concern for the fruits as something received by him, but sacrificing them to the divine or to the all. Even though lacking this feeling, he may simulate it, and in time, so suggested to himself that he acquires in some measure the attitude that is proper. This is not likely to be perfect, but it may in time prove to be enough so that the door will open and then there descends upon him the fullness of the attitude itself. And the same is true with respect to preliminary discipline or janana yoga. One may come with philosophic ideas for which he has a strong preference, a view of the world to which he is strongly attached. And the renunciation of this may be quite difficult. Nonetheless, by trying, by opening himself, by 
being prepared to accept what may be as an attitude imposed, in fact, a certain degree artificially, gradually he grows in to some approximation of the true attitude. And then when truth descends, he has the open mind which will receive it without the resistance. But in the case of the yoga of love, no simulation of attitude is adequate as a discipline. One must have the flair of the true devotee or lover. And this becomes, in its fullness, something very intense and complete. It is an attitude of self-giving, so all-possessing, that there is no thought of self itself. There is no seeking of a return, but simply a completeness of giving to the other, which may be called God or Buddha or by any other name. This becomes so complete that Anything required by that other, the divine or Buddha, is gladly granted and offered without any regret, even though the demand is the exclusion of self. And even beyond this, when one has dropped the burden of selfhood and known the fullness of that state which in the beginning seemed like a kind of death, yet when realized is the fullness of the life itself. Yet even having reached, reached this point, if it is required that he go forth and assume the burden of health, selfhood, for unnumbered helpers, he would gladly do so, for he wishes nothing other than to comply with the request of the beloved. This yoga leads to a peculiar kind of intimacy with the otherness. Call it what you will. It is a fact of experience that there is and otherness, whether it is another part of one's own being or a transcendent otherness, which some call God and some call Buddha. It is a fact and a unquestionable fact of experience that one at certain stages becomes keenly aware of this otherness. And in this state of realization of the otherness, there is an inexpressible tenderness and richness and beauty 
and joy and sweetness. I might give some account of my own realization of this type of experience. Back in 1929, I had my first glimpse. On one occasion, I think I was digging into the problem of preparing a lecture. There, I finally found myself transformed into a state of a superposition upon another consciousness, or perhaps better, a superposition of another consciousness was placed over my own consciousness. This I recognized as the consciousness of the Blessed One. There was in it an indescribable sweetness, a sort of uplifting that produced of a sense of an ineffable purity. And involved the sense that this sadhika was of value to the all. It is so lofty that the touch again with the mundane world was like going down into something very coarse indeed. Another occasion was in the days of August 1936, shortly before the first fundamental realization on August 7th, I was on the banks of El Dorado Creek at the bar about the time of the realization known as substantiality is inversely proportional to ponderability. When a sense of benevolence took possession of me, this was not a cultivated benevolence, a moral effort on my part. It was simply a dissent of the quality of an all-encompassing benevolence. There was in that environment entities that ordinarily are regarded by us as unpleasant, such as rattlesnakes, black widow spiders, daddy long legs, slugs, scorpions. Our ordinary attitude towards creatures of this sort is one of repulsion or revulsion, a definite distaste, distaste, even a fear of the poisonous members of the group. But this benevolence that descended caused the feeling in me to include even then, along with all other things, 
a sense that they too were a part of the all, evolving in their way, and not evil or repugnant things in reality. It was a totally non-artificial attitude, but one that was completely spontaneous, which was an expression of an underlying quality behind the veil in this universe. These were four days of what broke forth on August 7th and persisted over a long period of time in which there was a descent of unimaginable delight. This delight has little in common is what we call pleasure. In fact, it was a quality with respect to which the thought of pleasure in the ordinary sense brought in a feeling of something painful, something to be enjoyed. All the mundane values, whether painful or pleasant, took on a quality of sordidness. One felt a dis distaste for embodiment in an animal body. There was even an inclination to cast it off, something which had to be resisted. The exuberance of the feeling was beyond the capacity of the organism to contain it. It carried a force of strong purification. One felt himself as standing upon holy ground. And one felt a good will that extended to all creatures, not only those that are noble manifestations, but those that we ordinarily regard as ignoble and God and evil. There is in it a quality of indescribable sweetness. And here is a mysterious thing, something strange and not yet adequately explained in my understanding. This sweetness can manifest almost physically, like a nectar, on the lips and in the breath, almost something that one can take. Analysis showed that it was not something from outside, but seemed to be associated preeminently pre with the exhaled breath. There was also a sense of beauty transcending all experience of beauty as attached to the things of the environment which is our ordinary sense as a beautiful flower beautiful scenery, beautiful permit, persons, beautiful gems, and so forth. Something which we think of ordinarily 
as a quality possessed by the object which we perceive, but rather there was a beauty of a self existed, a quality which could be bestowed upon the object which, though it might be ugly in the ordinary sense, became thereby beautiful. Beauty was a quality which spread over all and enveloped all. This, all of this which I have described may be called the aesthesis, the neglected side of Western man and the side which is so well developed among the Orientals. One feels here especially that he stands upon holy ground. And the result is that with the powers of the yoga of action and the yoga of knowledge, one may go forth into the arenas of the world and meet all comers with a fiat of a transcendental will and the dialectic of a profound and subtle reason and ask no part quarter and accept none. Strong in the power of transcendental will and the transcendental knowledge, he faces all. But this that belongs to the yoga of love seems that it should abide behind the veil in the temple where abides the holy place, the something which underlies all motivation but is not carried on the surface or carelessly upon one's sleeve. One thing which this yoga of love achieves as neither of the other two forms of the tri marja is a sense of something more than simply a reconciliation with this manifested universe. But in that but beyond that a feeling of acceptance of it with all of its darkness and its painfulness as realized in the ordinary sense. One might be inclined to withdraw from life having known the knowledge and having known the will. One might seek to return to the mother womb of the universe to abide in that transcendental state beyond all conceiving. But he who knows the yoga of love is content to accept the world which the power behind the world has produced and to bring to it such blessings as it may be possible to do to serve the end of the redemption of it or the transformation of it because 
This is not the divine beloved wishes, and that is sufficient reason. There is no longer a question as to whether light is worthwhile, as to whether thought is worthwhile, or as to whether doing is worthwhile. There is no longer a feeling that this may all be a divine mistake, something that should be cut off and abolished, but a happy, but instead a happy willingness to go along, to become part and partial of it, knowing that there is adequate reason for this, that is, and a joyous acceptance of it. This is a partial portrait of the yoga of devotion. There is something which should be added to what has been said in the form of of a commentary. Joy is attractive, naturally, and therefore there is the temptation to seek joy as an objective. And here, Self can enter into the picture in an invidious sense. There can be the temptation to seek joy by routes that are entirely improper. True yoga is incompatible with self-seeking. Seeking of joy or seeking of knowledge as a possession or seeking of power also as a possession. The essential thing is self-giving, self-abandonment. Now it so happens that it is possible by certain devices such as the use of drugs of a certain sort, such as the employment of certain practices typical of the Tantra, to break in to an experience, a minor experience of delight without having dissolved selfness. And these are temptations. It is false to think that there is any shortcut to the real attainment of yoga. It is possible, however, to attain an imperfect and perhaps even false appearance of yogic objective by the shortcut methods. And that may be a temptation that will actually delay the ultimate attainment perhaps for many lifetimes. The essential objective 
is the attainment of truth, be it pleasant or unpleasant, or the attainment of God realization to fulfill the purposes of the divine, or the attainment of Buddhahood to fulfill the underlying purpose working in the universe. For this, self-renunciation is necessary. One must give up the hope of attaining something as a possession. He must be willing to abandon all as an instrument, as an object of self-possession. He must be able to give all and then in time there will be a return but it's not but that return can be no part of his motivation. Self-giving must be his motivation, even though the self-giving may lead to the via doloroso if such should be the will of that which is the heart of the universe. This, it is a pitiful sight to see these many young people of goodwill, of idealistic tendencies, giving themselves over to the illusions produced by the shortcuts of the drug or tantric practices. Body disciplines are only of subsidiary importance and they're not for the purpose of attaining something for self. Largely, they are only minor aids. What one eats, what one does with the organism is a mere incidental detail. Self-giving is all important. Self-abandonment. That is the purpose. Even a willingness to stand outside the veil. Even the willingness to grant to some other, if such were possible, the realization which one seeks and to forego it oneself. That is part of the fundamental discipline. This is a essential discipline. All these actions that give something like a counterfeit of the real thing lead only to what is known as the intermediate zone where one may be lost for lifetimes. Be not impatient with time. The hour will Right.
if the delight comes, be prepared to be just a channel through which it flows to a starving humanity. Be willing to sacrifice one's own personal enjoyment of it so that it may serve the good of the whole. For if one seeks to dam up the stream which flows from Sumeru, to make it into a personally possessed lake, the waters will become stagnant and even poisonous. To be a channel for the for a stream, that it for this stream that it may flow through to the starving many, is the one true attitude where that stream is un remains uncorrupted and pure and in the flowing through leaves a delight for him who has become such a channel seek realization not for self but so that humanity may be blessed.